Hello and welcome to McDougall's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougall. I'm your host and their daughter, Heather McDougall. This month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so we will start out talking a little bit about breast cancer and then move into general questions. I have dozens of questions that you all have submitted to me by email, and I know many more are going to come online, and we will do our best to get through as many as we can, but we've only got an hour, so lots to talk about. Hi, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougall and Mary. How are you? Oh, hello. Good. We're just fine. Yeah, we're, we're, doing, we're doing just fine and glad to be with you. And five o'clock, of course, on Sunday, a real special time to look forward to because that's our chance to, to talk to some of you who've been trying to follow the McDougall program for a long time. And those of you who have done really well with the McDougall program, but you have friends and relatives who don't quite get it or they haven't gotten involved in what we're doing. And we want to have some way that you can share with them what the McDougalls are all about and that they might want to get involved with us and we want to take our approach. So that's why we come on five o'clock on every Sunday night. We will do that for as long as you guys would like. <laughs> we seem to be building our audience and that may be a good sign that we're, we're spending your time and our time worthwhile as uh, is this meeting and the fact that more and more people seem to be watching our YouTube presentation. So yeah, it's uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month and now I've been celebrating Breast Cancer Awareness Month for about 25 years since uh, AstraZeneca, the drug company, decided to, to make this a, the official Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But you have to understand that it's really Breast Cancer Industrial Awareness Month. It's for you to be, uh, be aware of the, of the businesses of, uh, you know, of buying cancer chemotherapy and radiation and surgery and well, they happen to make an anti-estrogen product, which is used to treatment of breast cancer. So, oh, AstraZeneca does? Yeah, Tamoxifen. They started okay. out doing that. Well, that's been around a long time. A long time. Long time. Anyway, anyways, it, that's that's what all the pink ribbons are about, and everybody seems to be getting in it into the the pink ribbons for this month. So we figured that we should do that. It's kind of pink you're wearing. Yeah, kind of pink. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, even outside our window, the spires. Are pink. The Portland spires on, on the river are pink or as close to pink as they can get. I'm kind of a lavender yeah. pinkish color. And you'd think that uh, breast cancer awareness would at least include some discussion about what causes breast cancer. And what causes breast cancer, we've, we've known pretty much since 1969, when Dahl published his, uh, his reports in a British journal, where they looked around the world at different countries, all the way from Thailand to to China and Japan and the United States, Norway and Sweden. <laughs> what they did is they looked around the world and they compared the incidence of breast cancer and they had lots of good data on this with the diet. And they looked at uh, the animal fat intake and that's what correlated most strongly with whether or not they had a high rate of breast cancer in a particular country. In countries like Japan, they had very, 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 very few cases. And in fact, it was almost unknown in, in Japan, even after World War II. I got a, um, uh, a note, an email about uh, about two years ago from a woman in Japan who ran a breast cancer group for Japanese women who got breast cancer. And she was the one that noted it as the fact that her parents and grandparents said they weren't even aware of breast cancer. You know, they, they'd never seen it. And of course, it's becoming more and more common in Japan. Is Breast Cancer Awareness Month um limited to the United States or is it all over the world, you know? Uh, probably all over the world. I, I don't oh, okay. know the answer to that question. But it seems like it's, when you hear, when you talk about breast cancer awareness, what they're promoting is screening for breast cancer. Well, but, they're doing that, and but it originates in a company that sells drugs to treat breast yeah, cancer. Yeah, I know, but the awareness make, tries to make people aware that they ought to be screened to prevent, supposedly, Prevent getting uh, mm -hmm. breast with groups headed like the one by headed by Katie Kirk. Katie Kirk. Yeah, they yeah. talk about screening. The, the 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 what newscaster that is in charge of uh, is one of the main figures in breast cancer screening in the country, mm -hmm. isn't it? Katie Kirk is that her name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was the one who had a colonoscopy done on TV, and then last month she made the announcement that she herself suffered from breast cancer. So whatever she's doing, I don't want to do it because it's not working. 
didn't work for her. It's not working for you either. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm not a believer in mammography. It's based upon the scientific studies, which I read carefully. And if you want to read a, a, a good review of them, uh, Peter Gotchi, who is a very, very famous uh, doctor from Denmark, and he was one of the founders of the Cochrane Collaboration. He wrote a book, uh, Mammography, Truth, Lies, and Controversies. You can buy it on Amazon. I know it's still for sale. It's expensive, but it reviews the studies on mammography, and it's the basis for why the Cochrane Collaboration in the year 2012 Carpet collaboration, I mean, if you know about it, you know what a powerful organization this is and how honest they're supposed to be about reviewing the data. And if you don't know about it, you should look it up. You should look up Cochrane. On Google because it really explains the Cochrane collaboration. Yeah, and why you should believe what they have to say. So in 2012, they put out brochures in, two, in 13 languages that told women to not get breast cancer screening. In other words, not to get mammographies. And uh, that's based on the research. You know, the research I've been over and over the studies uh, that have been done, the Mama Sweden study and the Women's Health study. I mean, I, 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 those are, this all happened in the time that I was practicing medicine. You know, uh, right in front of my eyes, this became, you know, part of the news for me every, every day, every new study, every new finding, every new discussion during the past 50 years that I've been in the active practice of medicine, all this has happened. So I, I saw all these studies that came out in the various medical journals and the controversy around them and the discussions and so on. Miller's study in Canada, which showed that actually the women did terrible who had mammograms. So <clears throat> this is all put together in a book uh, by Peter Gossi. Gotchi. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. has a, he has a very difficult to pronounce last uh, he name. He does. But it's, you know, it's just, it's, I suppose it's something I should learn. Anyway, uh, Peter was uh, involved and in, he was the head of Cochrane Collaboration for 23 years. But uh, th there's a good book to read. Actually, I did an interview with Peter last week. Do we have that up yet, Heather? It'll be on YouTube tomorrow so everyone can watch it then. Oh, okay. So I, I did a, uh, a nice hour long interview. You really want to meet this man. So it'll be up tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And uh, so they clearly tell you not to get mammograms done. And uh, at, at best. <laughs> so you really have cancer on the mind right now, Dad. You are just finishing up a, a two hour session. Uh, and we're doing a 12 day course right now, just finishing that up. And one of your talks is on cancer. So you've been talking about that already quite a bit, um, but some questions have been coming in and I'd, I'd love your input on that. Uh, this is from Penelope, who's done all the traditional treatments, chemo, mastectomy, she's on tamoxifen. Um, let's see, now um, she's wanting to know if it's necessary for her to have that, take that tamoxifen because she's already had her ovaries removed. Oh. Well, that, that's probably, I'd say it's okay to do. And, you know, the, the evidence is not there because the studies have not been done. Uh, what you want to do is you want to derive, deprive the tumor of estrogen because estrogen makes the tumors grow faster and you die sooner. So the things that discourage estrogen is you can take tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors which block the action of estrogen at the cellular level. You can do that or you can have your ovaries removed or, or you can take cancer chemotherapy. The way cancer chemotherapy, the traditional cancer chemotherapy, so cytoxin, 5-4-uracil methotrexate and adriamycin that I so commonly used uh, in my practice. They have some newer agents out now, but those are the ones we commonly use. The way they work is by killing the ovaries. And the reason we know that is that only women who had uh, menopause happened. In other words, the chemotherapy was toxic to the older ovaries and they stopped menstruating, stopped producing eggs. Only those women in a subcategory show benefit from taking cancer chemotherapy because they knocked the estrogen off. They chemically castrated the women. It made them throw up for a year and go bald for a year to castrate them. Well, very unkind to say that. Okay, I have a question. If, if someone has had their ovaries removed, right. so they're not 
producing estrogen. Right. Then why would you take tamoxifen? Because, because you get estrogen it, in the food? No, because right, no, because you make estrogen in other body tissues. Like oh, you okay. make estrogen in your body fat. So what these drugs do is they block the effects of estrogen at a cellular level. So any estrogens that are made in other parts of the body, you know, the ovaries are gone. That's a big major step to reducing uh, estrogen uh, stimulation of any tumor. Uh, to uh, to uh, to add the addition of these drugs may be beneficial. I would say nobody studied it. I certainly have no objection to somebody taking, you know, that particular effort. So Stephanie's wondering if cancer always needs to be treated. You know, we talk about that. You find cancer, you treat it. What's your recommendation? Well, I, I don't know how you're talking about treating it. You're talking about doing a lumpectomy uh, or radical mastectomy. I mean, there's all kinds of variation. But back at the turn of the century, <clears throat> between the 1800s and 1900s and early 1900s, a woman who got breast cancer she was su subjected to having the arm on the affected side removed. Back when I first started practicing medicine, a, a, a usual approach was a radical mastectomy. And in that case, they took the breast, they took all the lymph nodes on that side, and they took the muscle underneath. So a tremendous impairment in the woman's physical appearance and also her ability to use her left arm. But that was called, you would never recommend that. People had nothing done except for no. prostate cancer. Then, then they can do have nothing done, right? Yeah. Watchfully. And I'll try and remember why I tell you that the prostate cancer, not okay. But anyway, so the next uh, the next thing that happened is in the 1980s. Instead of radical, we did something called a modified radical, where we took the breast and the lymph nodes but left the muscle. And then came about a treatment of doing only a lumpectomy. This was done at Cleveland Clinic as, as part of their standard practice. When we got breast cancers, they do, they do lumpectomies. And in that case, all you do is take the lump out. But somehow or another, that wasn't enough for most doctors. Uh, instead, they wanted to add radiation because radiation uh, improves the, the chances of, of it become, coming back locally, uh, but also improving the chances that it won't come back locally would be to make sure you've got clear margins at the time of surgery. So if you can remember these statistics, that may, may be just too much to even tell you about, but <clears throat> if you have a lumpectomy done by the general practice of medicine where they're really not interested in whether they got the uh, all the margins clear of tumor, that wasn't their goal, the rate of recurrence in the chest is about 30 to 40% of women, which leaves 60% that wouldn't need any radiation or any radical surgery. It only comes back in about 30 to 40%. If you add radiation, then you sterilize the breast. So any tumors that escape into the breast are killed by the radiation. And so the risk of recurrence then is about 10%. Just like radical surgery, you take the whole breast off, the recurrence in the chest wall is about 10%. This is a, a quite a mutilating operation. To be. And the other thing that I'd like to tell you is that if you have had just a lumpectomy, that if cancer does come back, say you're in the 30 to 40% where it comes back. You know, remember, that's a lumpectomy just done by the general practice. That's not a lumpectomy done where the doctor was conscious to get clear margins. When you're conscious to get clear margins, the rate of occurrence is down close to what you get with radiation added or a mastectomy, down close to about 10% recurrence. If you have a recurrence at that time, say it's five years or 10 years later, the surgeon can go in and take more of the tumor that grew back, or the radiotherapist can go in and add radiation, and you get the same survival results. It doesn't really, it doesn't matter what kind of surgery that you do, you live the same length of time, whether you do the left arm, the radical, the modified radical, the lumpectomy, the lumpectomy of radiation, you get the same survival rates. And the reason is, is by the time you find a tumor in your breast, on average, it's been growing for 10 years. And so it spread to the lungs and the liver and the bones long before you knew you were sick. And that's beyond, it's beyond the field of surgery. It's, it's spread all throughout the body. It's, surgery works right here. You know, radiation works right here. It doesn't take care of the, the tumors that spread to the other parts of the body. And that's why there's no survival benefit. In fact, <clears throat> I collected it one time. I've lost this data, but I can find it again. I collected one time women who had no treatment at all. They just let the tumor grow. 
And they actually had a better survival chance than women who had any kind of treatment. Not worse, but better. And that's because they didn't have to go through a lot of things that cause, that encourage tumor growth and suppress the immune system. Like the surgery suppresses the immune system. Blood transfusions you get at the time of surgery suppress the immune system. Taking out the lymph nodes, they, they suppress the immune system. So somebody who said, hey, I'm not going to get treated at all. They actually have a better functioning immune system, but you don't want to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't. You don't want to do that. Because I also yeah. have a half a dozen patients in my past that made that choice of not having any surgery done. And what happened is the, the tumor would break through the skin and cause a, a mass like a like a, a patty of hamburger on your chest wall. It was oozing and bloody and stinky. And, you know, it was really not a good thing to happen. <laughs> but again, you know, that could be cleaned up with some further surgery and radiation you know, to a point. I mean, you get to a point where it's just too, too much of disease. You can't stand have it at all. But uh, so, yes, I, I don't, I recommend lumpectomy plus clear margins. If you have, if the tumor comes back, then you have additional surgery and radiation. And I recommend that women do something to, to reduce the estrogen levels. In addition to, uh, to chemotherapy and tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors and cutting your over out without reducing estrogen. Another profound thing that you can do to reduce estrogens and to improve your immune system is you can eat well. <laughs> the, the rich Western diet for a whole bunch of mechanisms results in the production of high levels. You have 50% more estrogen in your body when you eat the Western diet as opposed to when you eat the kind of diet that we recommend. So you dramatically cut your estrogens down by Eating well, just losing weight causes a reduction in estrogens because your fat cells make estrogen. You, the fat cells take hormones made in the adrenal glands and convert them in the fat cells into estrone, which is a, a pretty powerful estrogen. So you have a, a whole bunch of tools out there that don't involve any expense or any harm to your body, like eating well and losing weight. <clears throat> So, you know, that's, that's the way I recommend women get treated. In, um, in, in a lecture that I that put up on YouTube, that's how I treat breast cancer. It talks about all these things I just talked to you about. So if you want a nice review with the scientific data, you can, you can watch this one hour lecture. It's on YouTube, it says enter McDougal and breast cancer. And one of the things I showed was Bernard Fisher's work. Bernard Fisher, you know, if you, if you worked at the time that I worked at, uh, he was one of the main heroes in cancer medicine. And he did the classic study, never to be repeated, where he compared the survival rate of women who got a mastectomy versus the women who got a lumpectomy, no radiation, and a lumpectomy plus radiation. The survival rate was the same. The same. There's no study that compares with, with the Fisher study. There's no data out there that would suggest otherwise. So it proves what I've been trying to tell you since the first talk we did in October on breast cancer is that this is a slow growing disease that starts as a single cell in the breast, which becomes damaged. And it stops obeying the rules of cells, which are you're not supposed to divide anytime you want. You're not supposed to become unneighborly. So they start dividing at their own free will, not like rapid fire, but their own free will. The divisions are they double every 100 days on average. So you go one cell, then two, that takes three and a half months, and then to four, that takes another 100 days, and then to eight, that takes another 100. So you double every 100 days. And by the time you've had cancer for two years, you've got 100, 100 cancer cells lurking in a breast that contains 100 billion cancer cells per breast. Impossible to detect. If you continue the, the uh, multiplications every 100 days, it doubles. By the time you've hit cancer for six years, you've got a tumor mass of a million cells. It's a millimeter in size. It's the size of a period on a paper. It's the size of a lead tip of a pencil. You cannot find it. It's been growing for six years. It's already spread to other parts of the body if it's going to spread. It's called metastases. And the divisions continue, you know, from six to 10 years, it grows from a millimeter to a centimeter. 
a centimeter lesion you can feel. It's a half an inch, size of an eraser. You can find it by self-examination. Now, one of the things that I'm going to tell you right now, which won't make sense unless you listen to me carefully, is tumors found by mammograms have been growing on average of 14 to 17 years. Let me tell you why. If you take the whole group of tumors, the ones that grow rapidly are found by the woman herself. Because, you know, at the interval time she's feeling, she finds them. They grow rapidly. They're found, say, on average of six years in development. The ones that are found that are found later in life are the ones by mammograms. They find the slow growing tumors. And that's why it's been on average 14 to 17 years by the time you find the cancer after it started growing. That's why mammograms fail. I've told you they fail. Cochrane tells you they fail. It, it, they will not save your life. Uh, and they are the ultimate in disease mongering. Disease mongering is taking people and turning them into patients. It's a, 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 a net that's thrown over society where you catch a whole bunch of people. It's a way of getting you in the medical system. Ladies and gentlemen, you can become my patient in two ways. One is you can get sick and you can come to me and you can ask for help. Doctor, will you help me? In that case, I don't have to have much evidence. So what I'm going to do is going to help you. I'm going to do the best I can. The other way we can develop a relationship is this. I can come looking for you. I can knock on your door and I can say, ma'am, you need to get a mammogram. You need to have your colonoscopy, sir. You need to have a PSA done, sir. In that case, where I come looking for you, there ought to be absolutely no doubt that I'm going to do you more good than harm. Don't you think? I do. That's what a screening involves. It's just throwing a huge net on the public and catching a whole bunch of people and bringing them into the system. Well, I tell you, I'm really pretty tough tonight. <laughs> well, what I was trying to bring up earlier is I can't think of any cancer that you talk about that you recommend no treatment for except prostate cancer. Uh, well, the problem is, you see, these tumors that cause local problems. Like I told you, the mess on a woman's yeah. chest. Yeah. If you don't treat a colon cancer, you can get blockers of the colon. Right, right. So, uh, but you don't treat these things to save your life because they don't save your life. It's already too late. You, you treat them just to save you, you, further other problems. problems that they're going to have. Yeah. But so, but well, the prostate, cancer, the prostate is hidden between a man's pelvic bones. He, he doesn't notice it. He doesn't feel it. If he develops obstruction uh, that causes problems urination. With urination, we can give Then you have to do something. Well, usually an anti-testosterone drug takes care of it. Okay. Uh, but you might have to go in and do some surgery and open up the blockage. But, you know, you're well past the point where you're going to go in and take the prostate out. Uh, well, well, I know with skin cancer, you tell people to put some cream on it. Well, that, and, you know, I'm trying to think of any other cancers that, that you talk about that you say. Well, lung cancer shouldn't be treated. Oh, okay. You know, there's a real example of brutality in medicine where you find lung cancer. You end up giving them chemotherapy and radiation and surgeries that kill them. Or taking out one lung? Well, that's what they do sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, this is big business, ladies and gentlemen. There's a tremendous my effort to convince you that what's being done is in your best interest. You need to look at the research. You need to see the controversies that doctors are arguing about. It's all based around what I just told you. The first night when we got together, I gave you uh, the natural history of breast cancer. It takes 10 years of growth before you can find it on average. That's colon cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. Solid tumors takes 10 years. Heather, you want to get on some other questions? Uh, <laughs> I've got all kinds of questions. So uh, this is still about cancer. Say you've had a mastectomy and you had implants um, put in. Is that okay? Is that safe? Should we have those implants removed? Well, you know, that, that's again a cosmetic issue. That depends upon the woman. I, I would think that would be a very, a very good thing for most women or many women to do. You know, it depends on how she feels about herself and her anatomy. Because putting up a, a silicone implant in where the breast was removed can be, you know, life changing for the woman in a positive way. You know, can wear her clothes a lot easier and, you know, appears not to have had surgery. She has the implant put in. So I don't think 
you know, there's a lot of controversy about silicon implants and how they cause all their immune diseases. Don't they have something else now that they use? Well, they used to fill them with silicone, and then, but I think they're all made with uh, oh. silicon surfaces. Now they fill them with water, so when they burst, oh. they burst with well, water instead of right. silicon coming out. But uh, they may have some new ones, Mary. But, but it seems to me like whenever I read about someone that has had um, a mastectomy, they almost always talk about reconstructive surgery afterward. Yeah, I think it's, so it's, it's something I think woman, it's fairly common these days. It, and it, it could be and should be, especially in a woman who's particularly concerned about her appearance. Yeah. You know, I, it's, you're never, you're ne you're never going to have anything that looks like a real breast when you take the clothes off. But wearing, you know, clothes and a sweater, et cetera, you're going to look pretty good. And that's important. But um, that, that's the reason women are doing it, is they want to look normal. Yeah. And, and these breast implants can do that. As opposed to augmentation breast implants, where you want to have this <laughs> done because you want to look, I guess, sexier or whatever. whatever. And you, you have uh, breast enlargements. So I can't tell you the number of women that I've had a chance to talk to who had these implants who've been angry with themselves for doing it. You know, I've never, and as a doctor, you know, I've had a chance to examine many women uh, naked from the top up because that's my job. And I can, I can honestly tell you, I've never seen a woman who's had, well, a couple maybe, that has had <laughs> breast implants that looked anything less like normal. Or you know, was happy about it. Or was happy about it. They look, they look like rubber balls stuck on your chest. And I have to take that back because, of, like I said, I've been a couple, they're, they're, a couple I've seen that look. Well, and they've look changed. Pretty decent. They've changed. Um, well, they changed the way they did it. Instead of putting yeah. it under the skin, they put it under the muscle. Right. And that's where I've gotten to, you know, uh, fooled a little bit. Well, I've seen a couple of uh, breast implants done where they actually put the uh, implant under the pectoral muscles. And that way it looks pretty close to normal, or can. I've seen some botch jobs there too. But I want to tell you something else. I've never met a patient who's had enlarged breasts, who has had them reduced, had surgery to take the breast tissues down in size. All extremely happy, without exception. I've, I've never met this, a woman who's been through that kind of surgery. But lots of women who had um, the idea of having their breasts enlarged has been a, a mistake for them that they had to live with. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about the, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Okay, can you talk about the BRCA gene? All the BRCA, BRCA, BRCA1 and BRCA2, B-R-A-C-A. A yeah. little bit, a little bit. This is associated with a high risk of getting breast and ovary cancer. And uh, women who have the gene, and uh, it, it's more common than people who come from Mediterranean areas of the world. It's a gene that's passed on through heredity. Uh, unfortunately, it's recommended <clears throat> that women uh, have prophylactic mastectomies and have their ovaries removed. When it comes to, uh, to doing both, there's a survival benefit. It's because, as I talked to you the first few minutes, when you reduce estrogens, you decrease best breast cancer growth. But if you just have the breast removed, there's no survival benefit when you have a BRCA problem. It's only when you have the ovaries removed along with the breast that you see the survival advantage. And it all makes sense if you could put everything together that I've told you so far in this half hour. But yes, uh, could, should you have prophylactic mastectomies? I think you should eat well. That's what I think you should do primarily. And then I think you need to carefully weigh having yourself go through this kind of extensive surgery. Uh, and look at the benefits as far as, you know, <clears throat> taking a woman who's not really had breast cancer yet and taking all their breast tissue out. Have, have but there, they can't, you know, they can't. Have take... there been any studies done for yeah, uh, people that have had the BRCA gene and well, they, they survive just, better? Yeah, yeah, they survive happening. better if they take their breasts off? I'd, and I'd have, you know, I, I, to give you any data, I would have to look at this, the, okay. the research again. But I, what I remember is, yeah, they're favorable results. But you have to take the ovaries out too. You can't just take the breasts because you have to stop the estrogen stimulation, which you can dramatically reduce by eating well and losing weight. Yeah. One of the things is I've, I've tried to explain to you is I, you know, I try, I try and give you what's done usually 
the established kind of medicine. And I tried to give you another point of view. I tried to make you understand what the real benefits are of, of getting these uh, screening, screening procedures done, various treatments like heart surgery or mastectomies. I try and show you the, the very limited benefit and a lot of harm. And sometimes uh, it's the opposite. It ends up causing you to die and, and uh, ruining your life. So when, I, when you realize that these are, are much less than you're being sold, then you think to yourself, well, what am I going to do? You know, it's not going to work to have heart surgery. A, a mastectomy is not going to save my life. Having a mammogram is not going to save my life. What do I do? I've got nothing to do. I got oh, I could eat well. <laughs> oh, you know, then then the idea of eating well doesn't seem so scary. You know, people have the have the tendency to take the easy way out, and for most people in their mind, the idea that a treatment paid for by an insurance company, where I don't have to think about it, I just lay there on the operating table, is easier than eating oatmeal or bean burritos. I don't think so, but I think that's in the, the general population's uh, mentality is that I'm going to have what everybody recommends. I'm going with the crowd. I'm going to have what my insurance company pays for. Uh, regardless of the research, I'm going to have this done because it's popular. And if I end up dying or doing bad, at least people won't say to me, well, you refuse to have this surgery and look what happened to you. You know, but it, it, read the research. It does, these things don't work, by and large. So, <clears throat> I, don't, uh, I can't hear you. We Heather. can't hear you, Heather. Sorry, I had to, I had <laughs> us on mute. <laughs> um, let's see. We're at five thirty. So, do you maybe want to switch gears and move on to some other topics? I've got lots, uh, uh, Jennifer. Uh, Go ahead. I say I would really like to. Oh, good. But I, 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 I just want to summarize for people. There's uh, two books that I've written that have chapters, extensive chapters on breast cancer. There's one of them for free and available on the website here. Which one is that? McDougal Corp McDougal for Women? Yes. That one you're offering free on the website. Correct. Okay. So you can go to our website, drmcdougal.com. And you can find several chapters on breast cancer covering the materials that I just talked to you about with the scientific references. And we're, these are books that I own. You know, we hold, hold the copyrights on them. So I can do whatever I want with them. And so we're offering them as free, no gimmicks. You can, you can take and send a thousand copies to all your friends and relatives. I don't care. <clears throat> so we're making that available this month. Other months we've made uh, McDougal's Medicine of Challenging Second Opinion available. We have the McDougal plan that we'll make available to you. We have a couple of cookbooks we'll make available. Well, there's one other book in there. I think I've got six of them that I own. But anyway, that's that's available. So you can do that. Uh, be sure to spend time on YouTube with a lecture I gave on, it's, uh, you can look it up by looking up McDougal and breast cancer. It shows you exactly how I treat a woman with breast cancer and why. And the, my ratings. You know, the newsletters I've gotten that are in our, on, on our website, my writings, this video, it's for you. You can take it to your doctor. You can show them. Look what Dr. McDougal says. Tell me why he's wrong. It says right here. It tells you why he thinks he's right. Tell me why he's wrong. Show me the research. You're trying to sell me this $10,000 operation. Don't you think we ought to talk about it a little bit? You know, all I ask is that you at least consider our point of view first. We're not asking you to spend money. We're not asking you to go under extensive treatments. And then if it's not what you want, there are lots and lots of most, 99% of the doctors that offer you drugs and surgery and radiotherapy, et cetera. You won't have any trouble finding that. That's standard. But start out with a very conservative approach that we offer. Okay, we're well, moving on now. Move on. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from Mr. Backyard Engineer. I've lost over 100 pounds following your program, but I'm struggling to lose the next 50. Any recommendations for a volume eater who's struggling? Well, this, this is a conversation we seem to have every program here. And the, the suggestion I give you is, uh, well, first of all, I can understand the 50 pounds. You've been carrying around an extra 150 pounds. You developed a lot of muscle mass and also bone 
material to carry around that extra weight. So you're starting out with a, a, a bigger underlying mass of people. And uh, I understand that. You may have some extra skin left over from uh, losing that 150 pounds. And uh, you know, but, but one of the main problems is that your body's gone through a lot of adjustment over the many years of weighing that high weight. And so it may take some extra effort. Now, I have no doubt that if I was trying to put you in a prisoner of war camp and feed you a cup of rice a day, that you'd lose it. So short of that, what, what can we do that's, that's not so restrictive? And certainly one that will not cause you to be hungry. There are a couple of approaches that we take, and you're, I would guess the listeners are familiar with this if we've helped them lose that much weight. One is the maximum weight loss program where you <laughs> increase the amount of green and yellow vegetables, which are low calorie, non-starchy. That'd be good for a volume eater too, because you yeah. can really fill up on low, low calorie, non-starchy vegetables. Yeah, then you're full. Then you can eat in big volumes. But these, these have very, very low calorie content. You know, the typical, typical diet is like celery and kale and lettuce and broccoli, broccoli and cauliflower. So, so you, you hit those harder and less starch. And all I recommend is uh, to go to a point of 50-50. In other words, half starch, half green yellow vegetables. The usual McDougall program is 90% starch and the rest green yellow vegetables and fruit. So a reasonable maximum weight loss program goes to 25% green yellow vegetables, 75% starch. A really powerful maximum weight loss program goes 50-50. But if you start getting to the point where 75% of your diet is celery and, and lettuce and kale and broccoli, you're gonna you're not gonna stick with it. You're gonna starve. You're gonna eat all day long. You have a grumbly stomach. Nothing's gonna feel good. So I think that's very impractical. The other uh, thing that we recommend, which is getting closer to that prisoner war camp, is to eat monotonously. It's called Mary's Mini. And it's, well, you tell me what it is, Mary. <laughs> well, it's, you choose one starch and you just, that's the only starch you eat um, along with green and yellow vegetables. So for example, you choose potatoes. So you have potatoes as your starch for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then you can add as many green and yellow vegetables as you want, but you only get to have potatoes for sure. at least 10 days. Or if you choose rice, then you only get to have rice as your starch for the next 10 days. And you get to have as many green and yellow vegetables as you want. And so it's really kind of boring. And so you tend to lose weight a little bit faster because there's not a lot of choice there. And when there's not a lot of choice, um, well, you do seem to lose weight. Well, faster. when you add more more variety, and people end up eating more. Yeah. There's the variety about, about maybe a third more they'll eat compared to monotonous eating. But as you know, you get down to Mary's Mini, you're getting close to that prisoner war camp. <laughs> and you know, restriction. What do they feed you in a prisoner war camp? Just oh, oatmeal every day for, for all your meals, just just oatmeal or just rice. So any way they can restrict the calories in a sensible way is gonna work out for you as far as losing more weight because you know the thought law of thermodynamics is calories in versus calories out. In other words, you don't manufacture, you don't get calories in the air, okay? So the ones that go in, you know, to have a balance occur, or if you wanna be in a negative, a, negative, a negative balance, then you have to have fewer calories going in and more going out, which brings me to a way that you're told often, which we also encourage, Get some exercise that burns calories. That, that's another way to do it. Or I'll tell you one way we haven't talked about, but but I, I think it's reasonable, Mary, for people to do it. It comes down to that cosmetic issue. If this is really a big deal for you, there are all kinds of laser treatments and freezing treatments where they stick these probes inside of you and they destroy the fat. You know what I'm oh, talking yeah, about? Yeah. yeah. You know, that, so go see a plastic surgeon who. We'll take it and kill a whole bunch of areas of fat cells. Once the fat cells are gone, they don't grow back. You have the number of fat cells that you were born with the rest of your life. They, they, don't, they don't increase in number. And once they're gone, if, they, if you destroy them, you, you know, cut out some of your fatty tissue, they're lost. The way you become fat is a single cell becomes engorged with body fat, with you know, triglycerides. Fat. But you don't increase the number of them. So again, 
there, there are situations which may call for things that in general, I don't think you ought to be considered. Like I don't think you consider these uh, cryosurgeries or these uh, laser treatments to be a, a ways to lose weight. Well, you know, something else I would suggest for a volume eater was to consider eating all day long. And because when I think of a volume eater, I think of someone's going to be eating three Gorgeous. times a day. Gorgeous. So they're going to really eat a whole lot at each meal instead of if you ate all day long or every two hours instead of, you know, and then your stomach would always be full and you wouldn't be so likely to uh, well, gorge well, and eat a whole lot. Actually, of actually there's research on it. There's a, a, lo a lot of research done. It. And what it shows is that nibblers, grazers, th those people who eat like 14 times a day, lose more weight than gorgers, okay, than people eat two or three times a day. And the reason is, is between, <laughs> is eating two or three times a day, you have periods where the body is dealing with new food coming in. And then you're not eating, and then it has to invoke mechanisms of storage. So it ends up taking the extra calories and putting them in the body fat. So you keep the mechanisms of storage active. When you eat 14 times a day, you never get into a period or a phase where you're, you're storing the extra food. So nibblers and grazers lose more weight more effectively than gorgers do it. There's also the amount of insulin produced. Insulin pushes fat into fat cells. You can actually measure the amount of insulin produced in 24 hours. And those who graze, if you take the area under the curve, and some of you know, or know what that means, you find much less insulin produced in the grazing population as opposed to the gorging. So you have less, less insulin to push fat and fat cells. So that was a good suggestion. I like that, Mary. Thank you. Lots of suggestions for that extra 50 pounds that he has to lose. And it's a question that we get often. You're right, every show, but it's a, it's a real struggle. Okay, next question from Jennifer. I was diagnosed with small fiber neuropathy, no known cause, no diabetic issues or treatment. Will I have improvement with this way of eating? I think so. So you have a, uh, you have a neuropathy, which means the, the nerves in your like feet and hands, particularly the distal nerves, are impaired, which means you have pain and numbness and burning and tingling that goes on. And uh, there are people who have polyneuropathies that are not due to diabetes, but most of the cases are due to diabetes. So uh, well, I, I, most of the data likewise has been done on people with diabetes, peripheral neuropathies. And the, I talk about them, in fact, I talk about them in my diabetes lecture, which you can find on YouTube. I talk about uh, two papers that were done. One was done by Neil Bernard of PCRM, and uh, he showed a, an improvement in peripheral neuropathy with our diet. And the other that was done by uh, a guy named Milton at, uh, at Weimart. Weimar. Weimar is a uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, retreat place that's uh, a few miles outside of Sacramento, California. <clears throat> in addition to it being heavy in their religious message, they also uh, teach people a very good diet and lifestyle. And Milton Crane, Milton Crane is his name. Milton Crane showed that um, he found was he found 24 people with diabetic neuropathy, and 17 of the 24 got completely relief, complete relief of the neuropathy going on the diet they teach, which is almost exactly the diet we recommend. And they maintained that improvement for four years. So yeah, I, I, I think you could do something about it, but you did a good diet, even if they don't call it due to diabetes. Uh, I, I don't see whether there's any reason it wouldn't respond the same way. And plus, what do you got to lose? <laughs> you know, it, they notice these benefits in just a few days. Just, just in a few days eating, eating a good diet, they saw that people are getting better, 17 or 24. Maintained for four years. And then if it doesn't work, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to take, you're going to take painkillers the rest of your life, or uh, well, there are a few other drugs that we give that, you know, that somehow or another get you thinking about other things besides the pain in your feet. Thank you. Our next question from Mamta. 
Uh, I've been following the starch solution for a year and my cholesterol came down from 213 to 163. However, I have slightly high uric acid and albumin. Is that typical of vegans? No, <laughs> uric acid is, uh... Uric acid is related to uric acid kidney stones and also gouty arthritis, gout. And uric acid occurs when you break down purines, which are your DNA and RNA in the cells. So cells that have lots of DNA and RNA are animal foods, uh, high protein animal foods, because the DNA and RNA synthesize protein. So you have a lot of this genetic material when you eat a animal-based diet. So this, the purines are the DNA and RNA, the breakdown of DNA and RNA, and the purines turn into uric acid. So uh, it sh this kind of diet should not cause the uric acid to go up. Or uh, I'll offer you an observation, and that is when people lose weight, Uric acid, which is stored in the body tissues, including the body fat, uric acid comes out of the bloodstream. It appears in the blood, so you'll develop a high uric acid level in the few days after you're changing your diet, but this ought to normalize. And uh, if you have a higher blood uric acid, and say the lab says, I wouldn't give it a second thought unless it was extremely high. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is from Yukonoka. My BP has dropped so low on the McDougal diet that I often feel lightheaded and my heart races during sleep. Is this normal? <laughs> well, I, well, it's not a complaint I hear very often. But did she say that she has uh, a syncope that, she, that gets faint? Is that what I heard her just say? Well, she just said that she feels lightheaded because her blood pressure is so low, but doesn't mention whether she's on medication or not. So well, that would be another thing to consider. Uh, if you're taking medication that lowers blood pressure, that'd be an issue. This is not a problem I usually run into. As far as your heart beating fast and you're laying at night, it's probably because you're paying attention to it. <laughs> if you're sleeping, how would you know? I don't know if you're laying if there, you're laying wildly. there, being anxious about something, maybe you'd be looking at the ceiling, and uh, then you'd notice it. Okay, let's see. Lots of uh, chatter about um, sugar-free gums and soft drinks. How do you feel about artificial sweeteners? Well, I, I'd rather, if I was going to eat something sweet, I'd rather eat the original sugar. It's these artificial sweeteners, they don't taste very good. And besides, they've been connected uh, to increased risk of cancer in animals. And they, because they cause sweetness to occur, uh, they, actually, they actually cause the brain to cause the body to release insulin. And the insulin drives fat into fat cells. And that may be one of the reasons that artificial sweeteners have a very poor record when it comes to weight loss. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I don't, I don't really see any advantage. I see some disadvantages. Uh, they don't taste at all like uh, the regular table sugar or honey or molasses or maybe. Well, don't you, don't you think people are looking for sweeteners because they think there are less calories? Well, no, so there, no calories. Yeah, yeah. So, so that would be a, a weight loss advantage because they wouldn't be getting the calories but, from sugar. But Mary, a, a, a teaspoon of sugar is only 16 calories. I know, but in one of, soft drinks, there's probably 12 teaspoons of sugar. There may be 20. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a teaspoon of fat is like 120 calories of oil. Yeah. So there's not much. And if you use sugar like we do or recommend in our program, it's a teaspoon of sugar and your oatmeal in the morning for breakfast. That's 16 calories. You're eating two to 3,000 calories a day. It can't mean that much of a saving by cutting out those 16 calories. In other words, it's putting your effort at the wrong, uh, the wrong nutrient. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Sugar does not turn into fat easily. It's called de novo lipogenesis. It's very hard for the body to take and convert sugar into fat. Again, the name of it's de novo, the new lipogenesis, the production of fat. And it's described in human beings as insignificant. In one study that I put, in, I thought it was so important, I put in 
the Stark Solution. It's a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, where they asked, they took obese and, and non-obese subjects, and they told them that they needed to eat 50% more calories than they usually ate. And they also added three and a half ounces of table sugar to their diet, in addition, okay? And that it, it took four months for them to add an extra pound of fat with that much added sugar and that many extra added calories. It took them four months to add a pound of fat. The body's not very good at making this conversion. Whereas it takes all the fat from your fork and spoon and it moves it to your hips effortlessly. It costs 3% of your calories consumed to do that. To convert sugar into fat costs 30% of the calories consumed. Very costly. Body doesn't do inefficient things. So if you're, you think the problem is sugar, you better think again. It's the fat. The animal fat, the vegetable fat is the fat. The fat you eat the fat you wear. I think I've said that before. <laughs> Thank you. Never hurts to hear it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question from Lydia. Uh, I've been dealing with stomach inflammation, which is causing a lot of heartburn. Heartburn. I eat healthy food, but still have pro problems. I've also been prescribed from motadine, but still suffer. Uh, okay, Heather, all right. Heather, would you it, I kind of miss that? She's having indigestion in the stomach. Stomach inflammation, heartburn. which is causing heartburn. Okay, well, I can, I can get a pretty good idea. Um, on our diet, raw vegetables cause indigestion. Cooked, they're okay. Particularly onions, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes are notorious. When you eat them raw, they cause irritation. Uh, onions, for example, we know there are a couple of substances that are easily boiled off. They're called volatile substances because you can turn them into gases easily. And if you heat the onion, it boils these gases off that are very irritating to the stomach. And so I can eat cooked onions. At, at, at the clinic in Santa Rosa, you know, where we were for 18 years taking care of people at the resort. I used to have to see patients all day long. And when they served the hamburgers with raw onions, I was done for the afternoon because of the horrible indigestion that I suffered from these raw onions. So I asked that the kitchen would start cooking the onions before they served them, and they did. And so we came up with browned onions that were thoroughly cooked. Never had a problem. So if you cook your vegetables, I think, and get away from the raw vegetables, the salads, et cetera, you're going to go a long way at helping the indigestion problem. The other thing you can do to help with indigestion is you can raise the head of your bed. Standard treatment. All doctors should be telling you this. You put a uh, 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 four by four or a couple of bricks under your head of your bed and you sleep at an angle like this. And that by gravity keeps the acid out of your esophagus. So it's not burning that, that part of the stomach. So that's another thing to do. Uh, there's uh, also some natural products out there that I haven't dealt with in years. Uh, just occasionally come across, but it's a de deglycerated licorice. Oh, I remember you talking about yeah, that. Yeah, I used to, I used to, it used to be one of my sponsors on my radio show that was syndicated <laughs> all over the West Coast was deglycerated licorice. You know, it works. You know, you buy it on Amazon, you buy it in the health food store. And uh, that that's an, uh, another somewhat natural, I don't know any of the adverse effects, way to deal with the, what is it? <laughs> all of a sudden we're, there we're there. <laughs> to deal with the, um, to deal with the uh, the irritation of the uncomfortableness of, of the stomach. Why is it deglycerated? I don't know. Okay. I don't know why they call it that, but it's deglycerated licorice is the way that the kind that they sell for the stomach. That 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 those kind of t details, I guess, I never learned about the product. But it does work. I had enough people take it that find it helps. I'll tell you another way you can try, you can help is you can take activated charcoal. You can buy activated charcoal as pills, but they're very expensive. But you can also buy it from your pharmacy in cans uh, where it's inexpensive. And you take activated charcoal, which is in every emergency room in the world, because that's what you use for poisonings. When people uh, take uh, oral poisons, one of the primary therapies is they, are, they take a nas nasal gastric tube if that's necessary, and they dump a whole bunch of, uh, of activated charcoal into the intestinal tract and it complexes the, the poisons, 
and saves them, saves their lives. Standard therapy. How would you take it? Would you mix it in with with water or something? Well, a, a good thing to do it because it's, it, you know it's these black particles. It's yeah. kind of disgusting. What is to get a, a, a empty carton, a juice carton, yeah, and a straw so you don't see it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> really, okay. that's a Agatha Thrash, who ran Uchi Pines in uh, Alabama. She's one of my contemporaries, and I don't know if Uchi Pines is still in existence, but they used a diet similar to ours. They used water fasting. They used uh, hot baths. From right. Anyway, Agatha Thrash. I had an, an interview of her that was lost on my radio show. And she used to use a lot of activated charcoal to treat all kinds of intestinal problems. Very effective. So that's another thing you could do. So I at least gave you a couple of, of drug, natural drug <laughs> therapies that you could try that I know work and uh, also stay away from I would guess, if I had to guess, not knowing this person, just just the you know the average person we talked to, is they started the McDougal diet but still had the baggage hanging on that you needed to eat a lot of salads and raw vegetables because you know that's typical of people who used to come to our live-in program is I'd walk in the first, second, or third day and I'd see a big plate of salad, you know, almost no starch. They still believe that the starches are bad for them, the salads. I, I tell you, why, why waste your money to come to the clinic? <laughs> you know, this is a starch-based diet. These salads are, are side dishes at best. And I would guess that this person, don't know so, but just guess, based upon the fact that so many other people have come to us with the attitude, you know, that starches are bad and salads are good. Get rid of the raw vegetables, cook them, or don't eat them at all. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, we've got three minutes left. So um, this is a good question. Gypsy Girl wants to know, if the fat you eat is the fat you wear, why do people lose weight on keto and Atkins? Because they make you sick. <laughs> the, the Atkins diet or keto diet, ketosis, which is what they refer to, is a state that occurs during starvation and profound sickness. When you don't have any sugar to eat, the body burns fat. And the byproduct of fat metabolism is, is ketones. Ketones suppress the hunger drive. So in that way, the Atkins keto diets cause you to lose weight. They make you sick. And also, they initially cause you to lose a lot of water weight. Because, because when you eat no carbohydrate, what your body does is it burns the stored sugar. It's called glycogen. You have two pounds of glycogen in your muscles and your, and your liver. When you go on a low carb diet, the first thing the body does is burn the stored sugar. So they lose, you lose two pounds of glycogen. But glycogen is mixed up two to one ratio with water. So it's mixed up with four pounds of water. So you lose six pounds of weight in the first three, five, six, eight days and go, I found a miracle. But you have to wait till the sickness sets in to get the long-term results. Keto diets are diets that make you go into ketosis. And ketosis occurs as a kindness of nature under two circumstances. One, when you're starving to death, you're only in horrible pain for three or four days. Then you have time to think about getting out of trouble. And the second is when you become seriously ill. You go into ketosis because you're not supposed to be gathering and preparing food. You're supposed to be recuperating. So that's why I called Atkins right to his face, the doctor that prescribes make yourself sick diets. But it goes further than that. It makes you sick long term, heart disease, cancer, constipation. When you're, when you're sick, you don't eat as much. So, well, you still eat enough meat to give you a heart attack. Well, I realize that, but you don't eat as much, so you don't have as much. You don't eat as many calories. Well, because you're sick. Yeah. Because you're going to ketosis. <laughs> you <Yeah>. got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give her an A for this hour. That was great. Well, the, the hour's up. That went by so fast. Well, Heather, I uh, just want to remind people the purpose of, of this hour we spend with you. Is I'd like to see you get well. I know some of you, it's not convenient to take further advantage of what we do, but we want you to know about our 12-day telemedicine program. Uh, when you get serious and you need to get off the drugs, and you need to get your health back, uh, we'll put you through 12 days of intensive education. Telemedicine done in your home or running one now, I think with the eighth day of the 12 days. 
And uh, you know, 90% of people have reduced or stopped their medications. They can see why they were sick. They can see how to get out of trouble. They love the food because our support specialists go into their homes by internet. And uh, we find out what your blood sugar is, your blood pressure, how you're doing, and what you're going to cook. And we help you make, make plans for the meals throughout the day. You know, we're a total support program. And after the 12 days, we take care of you for a year. That's right. We continue to meet with you and support you for a year. Now, what other program does that? So we run those uh, once a month. We're one room now. I think the next one's January. So we're going to take uh, December, probably November off. Mm-hmm. And Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're going to work in a new year. <laughs> the other thing we're doing is we're doing a series of lectures that I'll be doing. There'll be four hours a day, be four different lectures, one on protein, one on fats, one on carbohydrates, and one on vitamins and minerals. So a total of 16 hours of education that we're doing that you can sign up for. And uh, those will be starting in November. That's going to take up November and December. Yeah, that's what we're doing in November and December. We're running this series of lectures. They're going to be, they're going to be, listen, once you attend these lectures, you never lose an argument again about protein or fat or starches, et cetera. You'll never lose it again because you'll have all the information. You'll have all the scientific references. I'm going to make sure you get them. Uh, they will be they sent you in a deck of cards. In other words, the slides that I made that will be left over that you'll have for for sharing and, and reference and so on. It's a big deal. We're doing our, you know, quite an educational program coming up here in November, December. But otherwise, we'll see you next Sunday, right? Yes. October 30th. Can't wait. 5 p.m. Pacific. All right. Thanks, Thank Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Okay. See you next week. Bye.